All right, so um, in the fall of 1998, uh, I was in Schweinfurt, Germany, and our battalion had just gotten back from a year in Bosnia, along with the rest of our brigade, and the battalion commanders and spouses, brigade commander and spouse, we were having a cookout like you normally do, try to relax and all the rest of this stuff. And the brigade commander got a call, so he goes in the house, he's in there for a little while, he comes back out. He says, hey, guys, I need to talk to you, so we all go, go over there. And he tells us that we're going to invade Kosovo. And uh, so then we, he says, but, you know, we're not going to do it tonight. We're, we're actually going to wait a couple weeks. <laughs> and uh, so let's, we got to finish the, you know, the, the barbecue. So we go back, and one of the wives jokingly says, so are you guys going to invade another small country? Right? So how many of you all have been through that experience? You know, where you kind of no notice just get told hey you're going to go someplace where you haven't been before and you got to do a mission right i mean almost everybody in the military has had that experience and if if you're like me and you, you hung around long enough you've had that same experience about seven or eight times always in a different country and almost never the place that you thought you were going to go to uh i was an armor guy i spent uh you know the first third of my career getting ready to fight the russians defensively in uh, the Fulda Gap, and the first actual combat I go is offensive in Kuwait and Iraq uh, desert. You know, the exact opposite, literally the exact opposite of what I've been preparing to do for a decade. Uh, and you all have had the same experience. So the question to me is, is how do we prepare our military leaders for the next call they're going to get? For the next time they're going to be told, hey, go somewhere where you haven't been uh, and do something that you may or may not be prepared for and do it successfully. Uh, so, you know, really since the Cold War, this is what we've done to our, our captains uh, and their subordinates. So kind of down at the tactical level, the ODA level, the company uh, level and below, we've given them a patch of dirt someplace uh, and we've told them, go there, you know, make the security forces, local security forces successful, make sure the legitimate gov government flourishes, don't tear the place up, don't lose your guys, and don't kill a bunch of non-combatants. And oh, by the way, I'll be back in a year. You know, don't screw it up. And you have to ask ourselves, what have we done to prepare them for that? Uh, because we all know that just knowing the MDMP isn't going to cut it. Uh, you, you know, you have to learn about the culture, you've got to learn about the environment, you're confronted every day with all of these myriad of problems that you're not prepared for. And I call it like a mental movement to contact. You think I'm doing this, and then you run into this problem, and then you go this way, and you run into this problem. You know, one day it's the imam, the next day it's the black market, the next day it's, uh, uh, you know, some hig or somebody, the next day it's whoever. It's just over and over and over again, new problems. And so we have to ask ourselves, then, how do we prepare our, our, how do we teach and develop our subordinates to be able to learn how to learn about these problems and the environments. And so that's, that's learning challenge number one. So learning now challenge number two is this thing right here. Um, if you haven't read the book, The Seventh Sense, you are not a professional. Uh, you're just an amateur. It is an incredible book about uh, the future environment that we are all immersed in. Uh, and so I would strongly recommend it uh, to you if, if you have not read it. Great book. But in there, there's this quote. And the quote is by a Chinese statesman. statesman and basically, it compares the Chinese approach to strategy and operations to uh, the American approach. And our approach is to focus on the goal, on the objective, on the task. And their approach is to focus on the environment and the context. And I think that for our senior leaders, we have to say, how do we prepare senior leaders to be able to understand context, to be able to understand environments so that they can develop the right strategies, the right operational approaches, so that uh, those subordinates who've now learned how to learn when they get somewhere are, are able to do that. And so there's a linkage there between our strategic operational level learning and our tactical level learning. We have to, it's a continuum. But it's a, really a learning challenge, which kind of leads to my next point here. Really the only thing that human beings do constantly is learn. It's the only thing we do all the time is learn. Every moment, our bodies are learning. 
Uh, you know, right now, every one of you is learning something new that you didn't know just a moment before. Uh, and it's not necessarily what I'm talking about. It's context. It, it's, it's seeing, you know, how somebody's posture is everything. We're learning all the time. And learning drives how we think. And how we think then drives the decisions that we're going to make. And so at, when we talk about leadership and we say understand, visualize, describe, direct, the precursor to all of that way back here is learning. How we learn. Not what we learn, but how we learn. And so the question is, how do we learn? So most of us have seen this quote here, our good Air Force Colonel has, has quoted to us twice in the workshop that we've been in, in the last couple of days. And you know, we've all seen that. And there's a lot of great thoughts that come out of this idea that a specific plan is useless because no plan survives the first shot, but planning is important. And the reason that planning is important is because planning ultimately is a learning exercise. We learn about the enemy, we learn about the environment, we learn about ourselves, we learn about what might work, we learn about the tactics. Uh, we do all of that so that when we have to deviate from the plan, which as we know is almost immediately, we are best prepared to do that. We are best postured to do that because individually and organizationally we've learned as much as we can. So if learning is the primacy and if the focus of what I'm talking about is learning and how to learn better, uh, let me set some things together that we have to learn about. So contrary to current doctrine that says that there are five domains, space, land, sea, air, and cyber, there really in warfare are only three domains defined by the god of all gods, Clausewitz, right? And so those are physical, mental, moral. All warfare exists in those three realms. Part of it's physical, part of it's mental, cognitive, part of it's moral, ethical, etc. So interestingly enough, in education, Bloom's taxonomy has what's called psychomotor, cognitive, and affected domains, which if you look at the colors, they kind of line up. The psychomotor is really about physical application. The cognitive is really about the mental aspects of things. And then the effective is about the moral ethical piece of things. Lines up pretty neat. So in today's doctrine, uh, in our joint doctrine, we speak in terms really of three areas. Those three being the physical, the virtual, and the human. And of course, as everybody in JSAO and SOCOM and all the rest of that knows, there's been this giant debate over the, you know, the sixth domain being the human domain, et cetera, et cetera. But really, if you call it down, there is a human aspect to all warfare, which relates then to the moral and the effective, virtual, cognitive, mental, et cetera. It all lines up. So really, if you think of tactical, operational, and strategical, the tactical is really the realm of the physical. I'm shooting you, you're shooting me. I'm defending this, I'm digging a foxhole, putting in an obstacle, all the rest of that. The operational level of war is really the mental piece of it. We talk about the operational art. We talk about um, campaign design. It's, it's that mental piece. But the strategic level is really about will. It's about the, the will and the capacity of a population and of a nation or a non-nation state organization to be able to power through all the problems that they have and achieve their uh, their objectives, their ends, etc. So that lines up also. And then lastly, uh, if I kind of take a business approach to it a little bit, if you're familiar with uh, a guy named called Simon Sinek, who has written a book called Getting to Why and a number of other things, great short YouTube video you can watch and don't have to buy the book. Um, he talks about what, how, and why. And again, they kind of relate to the physical, the mental, and, and the moral. So all of these things line up. And so what that suggests is, is that if we're going to learn, we have to learn in those three realms. We have to learn how to learn in those three realms. Now, unfortunately, in the military, we're stuck with a problem. And the problem runs kind of like this. We are really good at the psychomotor domain. We are really good at the physical things. So for example, if you take your basic M4, the M4, when you're teaching somebody, brand new private, brand new lieutenant, how to, how to operate it, the first thing we do is imitation. We show them how to do it. The next thing we do is manipulation. We give them one and say, hey, take it apart, put it back together again, uh, you know, do that type of stuff. Then the next thing we do is practice. Dime washer drills if you're an old guy, 
uh, you know, other techniques if, if you're a younger guy, EST 2000, all the rest of that stuff. Then precision. We go out to the record range, we shoot, we qualify with the weapon. Next thing we do is articulation. Now we take it and we put it into uh, a scenario where there's pop-up targets and there's maybe, uh, um, you know, bushes and terrain and all those kinds of things. And then lastly is we then reinforce it over and over again. And, and we do have it. I've been out of the Army for 10 years. And I have not fired an M4 in 10 years, but I absolutely guarantee you that I could hit targets as well as I could when I was on active duty. Um, and I know I could take it apart and put it back together again because we are so good at that. We are so good at training tank crews. We are so good at training, uh, you know, fighters to be able to, to drop bombs and hit the target. We are so good at all of those kinds of things. That psychomotor piece is where we put all of our effort. And we are, there is nobody in the world that's better than us at it. But, unfortunately, when you get over the cognitive thing, not so much. Uh, I actually did a, a research project a couple of years ago for the Army Research Institute where we went around and we interviewed brigade commanders and we explained to them the cognitive realm and we said, where do you think you fall in on that? And they almost to a man and woman said right there, application. In other words, their guys had pretty good base knowledge, they could comprehend things, and they could apply it. But when you got up to the higher levels of analysis, synthesis, valuation, or uh, Bloom's taxonomy has changed a little bit now, the upper level is called creativity, um, not so much. In other words, their ability to analyze uh, things um, wasn't where the leaders felt that it needed to be in order to be able to go uh, immerse themselves in and solve and manage these complex problems. And then it gets even worse. Because the, the affected domain, that area of moral and ethical and those kinds of things, were really kind of down at the bottom. Uh, so for example, uh, you know, if you think about going to uh, Afghanistan. So for example, we give everybody, uh, you know, here's the classes on on uh, Islam and here's, you know, don't show the bottom of your feet to, you know, the, that kind of stuff. It's low level stuff. And then we get a little bit higher up that, how do you respond to it? So for example, you know, we figured out that if you kill somebody, you've got to do the reparation payments and those kinds of things. But we never get any higher than that. We don't get to the point that we really truly understand the cultures and really then adapt our operations, the way that we think to those cultures. Uh, you know, we try, but, you know, interestingly enough, Outside of in, in formal PME, professional military education, there's not a single course anywhere that's um, specifically on the effective domain. Not one. So, why have we not necessarily succeeded in Iraq and Afghanistan over, over the last uh, 15 years or so? Four man stack. We can train anybody in the world to go do a four man stack, enter and clear a room. Our challenge is. It's not the right room, and we don't know why it wasn't the right room. Because we're really good at this, we're not so good at that, and we're horrible at this. So how do we balance that? How do we bring it all up? And this is part of our design challenge, because design is about learning. And when we design plans, we have to learn how to learn in all three domains. Our plan can't be just really good over here in a psycho motor. You know, that was okay, Battle of Jutland, a bunch of battleships over here, a bunch of battleships over here shooting at each other. It's not any good anymore. If you're going to the Russians and, and with hybrid warfare uh, and reflexive control and all those kinds of things, it is all there and there. None of it's over here. When they go into Crimea to do the psychomotor part, they already won. It's over. They already won. So how do we get to be as good as them at doing that? We have to learn how to do that. So one of the things to think about is what's called triple loop learning. And some of you may have heard about this. So triple loop learning says that in the single loop, you're really focused on the what piece of it. And you're learning how to do things. Again, it relates back in a way to the psychomotor. The double loop, the second loop, is the how piece of it. It's how do I get the insights about what's going on. It's how do I reframe? How do I change the way that I think about things? And then ultimately, the third loop is how do I get to the why? Uh, how do I transform our perceptions? How do I transform the organization? We talk a lot about adaptive leadership. 
And adaptive leadership is good if you're in the psychomotor domain, but if you want to get to the effective domain, you have to use transformational leader, leadership. How do I transform myself to be effective in all three domains? How do I then transform my team? How do I transform my organization to be effective in all three domains? So triple loop learning is about that. It's about getting to the transformative state where we're using learning to transform ourselves. And that takes a certain amount of introspection. It takes a self-assessment of what am I learning, how do I learn? All right, so the problem is then compounded by the fact that we are now in this generational problem where different generations learn differently. Uh, and I'll put this up here. So baby boomers, that's me and a few of you guys in here. Generation X's, which is probably yeah. most of you in here. Hey, take credit for that. And then, then we got some net generation learners, basically those who are under 35 or so in, in today's parlance. They learn differently. They reason differently. Uh, they think differently. And so when you're doing design uh, or planning or any other evolution, you can't have just one way of learning. You have to figure out, how do I reach all my audiences? How do I enable them to learn how to learn when they learn differently than I do? They use different methodologies. They have different approaches. Um, you know, for example, they, you know, the, we all know the connection that the net generation has to their phones and stuff, but that's how they learn. It's how they reason. I was taught deductive, as was, you know, most of the people in this room. We use deductive logic. We take things apart, see how all the little pieces are there, and then we put them all back together again. A net generation learner doesn't learn that way. They learn by Googling something, and they look at the first choice, that because it, it shows them 10 choices on their phone. They look at number one and they say, okay, that's probably not gonna answer the question I want. Look at number two. Might, click on it. Nope, that wasn't it either. Let's look at number three. Yeah, that's exactly what I was looking for. So here's the interesting thing. When they go to combat, that's how they do it. When I, when I go to a village in Afghanistan, and I'm thinking about this village, and I wanna be able to get the village to, to do those things I talked about, you know, have a, have a uh, effective security force and legitimate governance, what do I do? I look at the village as kind of this like big conglomerate and I take it all apart in little pieces and I put it all back together again. And then I go do something. What a net generation lieutenant or captain will do, or staff sergeant for that matter, is they'll go, you know, I think the imam's the key to this. Let's go check that out. And then so they'll go try something. And they look at it and they go, nope, that didn't have any effect. Okay, that didn't work. What's something else we could try? Well, you know, let's take a look at the market. And so then they go, and they try the market. That didn't work. Okay, well, let's try something else. How about the grape growers? Grapes are really big down here in Argonaut province. Let's go check that out. And they check that out. That's the way they think. The way they operate is the way they think. And it's different. And so you have to figure out, how do I then bring everybody along so that we can operate effectively when we think and we learn differently? And so it's something important for us to think about. So, which kind of leads me towards, you know, what are some techniques that we can use? The first one is, is that we all have personal learning networks. Whether we recognize it or not, we all do. It's the people that, it's our go-to people that we go to to learn things. It's uh, some, it's like the cabal or some community of practice, some net list that we're on that we, you know, all the plans list guys get together and talk about planning or whatever it happens to be. It's, it's blogs that we routinely follow. It's sites that we go to. Maybe it's a, you know, we get the New York Times every day digitally, whatever. We all have a learning network. But for most of us, it's informal and, it, and it's episodic. So one of the ways that we can do it is, is organize our own learning network. Say, kind of take a step back, map out our learning network, see what it actually looks like, because you'd be surprised once you actually do it, and then find the gaps and say, how do I fill that gap? Well, guess what? There's this guy who does a podcast. I'll add that in. How do I follow, find this gap? Well, I don't know anything about the world economy, but if I read The Economist every week, then I'll get that. So, you know, you build out your personal learning network to enable you to learn. And if you have that philosophy, then when they call you in the middle of the night and say, hey, guess what? You're not doing anything. Why don't you go to Thailand? Then you go, okay, I just adjust my personal learning network to be able to go to Thailand. So what happens though in design, and 
you know, really, you know, whether it's an ODA or whatever, is how do I connect all these personal learning networks to make one organizational learning network? Because an organization doesn't know anything. The organizational knowledge is the sum of the knowledge of the individuals in the organization. So you're really connecting all these learning learners to create a learning environment that's for design. Because this guy doesn't need to know everything and can't know everything. But collectively, you can know a whole lot. And you can fill in each other's gaps, and you can fill in each other's holes. And you can project that learning environment, that learning network, almost anywhere. And if you're looking at it and you go, there's not a single person in my organization who knows anything about growing grapes uh, or how to market grapes. You go, hey, guess what? K-State University, right outside of uh, Fort Riley in the 1st Infantry Division, where I happen to be, has the best agronomy school in, in America. And oh, by the way, they've got a PhD guy there in grape growing. So we'll just connect to him. And that's part of our learning network. And then when we go to Argandab River Valley, we're connected back to that guy. And we can BTC with him or whatever. And Soft generally is really good at this. Uh, but we can be better. And we can think in terms of connectivity and not think just episodically. And one of the things that design helps us do is design this learning network. Because it's a co-creating thing. You're not just creating the plan, but you're also creating the learning system that enables that plan. So um, with all that in mind then, we talk a lot in terms of design thinking skills. But I would submit to you that they're also design learning skills and that there's a corresponding learning skill for every thinking skill. So what do you have to learn? Well, the first thing is visual thinking and visually learning. Human beings really do think in pictures, most of us. Um, and we think in terms of things like metaphors, and we think in terms of, of you know, flags and representations, you know, the, the, you know, the Muqtada al-Sadr picture on the wall in Baghdad, all those kinds of things. Visual thinking is very, very important to us. But you have to train yourself to be a visual thinker and a visual learner and be able to learn in pictures and be able to absorb information from pictures. So the first and maybe foundational piece is visual learning. The second is systems thinking and systems learning. You have to be able to see things in systems of systems. Uh, and that's very complex. And I'll, I'll go over uh, you know, a couple ideas here in a couple minutes about it. Uh, but you have to learn how to learn about systems and see systems. In psychology, we call it you know, gestalt learning. See the whole and how it all fits together. <coughs> Critical thinking, you know, that's always the big buzzword. It's the easy one. It's the one that is taught most of the time in our schools. But critical thinking is very, very important. Critical thinking has a flip side of the coin, which is creative thinking. Creative thinking, we don't teach so much. So for example, in the Command General Staff College of the US Army, there is a 10-hour block that has 155 slides because we're in slides on, cre on critical thinking. There is one optional slide on creative thinking. <coughs> and then you wonder why we're not innovative people. Well, guess what? We're not teaching anybody how to do it. We do very well what we get taught to do. We don't do very well things we're never ever taught. So you have to teach yourself to be a creative thinker. Uh, and you have to learn how to do that. Strategic thinking. and I characterize strategic thinking differently than most people do. Because I believe that strategic thinking is necessary at every, every level. So if you take your basic average captain coming in and, and taking over an ODA, and he, is, you know, he and his, his team get together and they say, this is the way we are today. Uh, we're going to deploy to the Ukraine in nine months. What do we need to look like when we deploy to the Ukraine? How are we going to get from there to here? And that's strategic thinking. Strategic thinking is thinking in time. It's managing all the problems to get from here to here over time. So strategic thinking is not just res reserved for the president and the sec def and those kind of guys. It's all of us. It's thinking in time. And so you have to learn how to think in time. And then there's detailed thinking, the who, what, where, where, why, how, and how much. Um, and that's something we all have to do because at some point you have to translate all this stuff into reality. 
it, you know, design's just a bunch of words, a plan is just a bunch of words, until somebody actually has to go out to grid coordinate one, two, three, four, five, six, and actually do something. So you have to be able to do the detailed thinking. You have to learn how to do that. The designer who can't do detailed thinking is just as worthless as the detailed thinker who can't do design. So you have to learn how to do that. So some thoughts about systems uh, learning. There's a tendency to think and see systems as just nodes and linkages. You know, it's just a bunch of dots with a bunch of lines connecting. And a system is much more than that. So a couple things that I would offer to you. There's a guy named John Holland who wrote a book called The Hidden Order. And what he talks about is the attributes and characteristics of systems. And he has these things like meta blocks and internal models and all the rest of that. So for example, if you take that idea of a four-man stack in a clear room, that's an internal model that the system uses. And it doesn't matter if the system is an ODA or it's a, uh, you know, 1st Battalion 18th Infantry. Um, you know, other things like flows. What do we flow from one place to another in the military? Well, we flow people from one place to another. We flow artillery rounds from the gun to where it impacts. We flow information, etc. So all systems have these attributes and characteristics. And if you learn how to see systems that way, you get a much richer picture of the system and you can do a lot about it. The other thing that I know a lot of you have seen before are causal loop diagrams. How does the system work? What influences what to cause what to happen? And if you can learn how to map out the causal loop diagram of a system, you understand it better. So then it's not just an imam and a black market and HIG and, and uh, you know, the grape growers and all the rest of that, but how does all of this influence each other? How does the system work? Because if you understand how the system works, then you can do something about it. The other thing is, is that systems don't work in isolation. So you have to see your system as connected to all of these other systems. Some of those systems are very big and very complex. You know, the enemy, a host nation, the other services, etc. Some of them are, are less complex uh, and, and more narrow, you know, the JAG or whoever it happens to be. So, but you have to be able to see the systems and learn about systems as being connected and integrated with other systems and understand how they interact and affect each other that co-evolution that occurs between systems. So you have to teach yourself how to do that. So we talked about critical thinking, and this kind of goes back to what I was saying before. Uh, the net generation employs a lot of abductive reasoning. It's a really kind of interesting thing. If you Google abductive logic, generally you get nothing until you, until you add in some additional qualifiers, because so much of the way that we think and the people who actually generate most of the information is based on inductive and deductive reasoning. But you have to learn all three, and you have to be able to apply all three, and you have to understand how to learn and reason using all three types of logic. And I think that's really part of the core of critical thinking, except for one more idea that I'll leave you with on the very last uh, slide we have here. Learning to be creative. You know, there's this tendency to think, well, you know, that guy's creative, and I'm not. You know, I don't know how to draw anything. Uh, I can't draw a straight line with a ruler. I can't play a musical instrument, blah, blah, blah. I'm not creative. Well, you can train people and you can train organizations or you can develop people and develop organizations to be creative and to be innovative. But you've got to do some things. As leaders, you have to generate a culture of creativity. You have to do that. You have to take on that responsibility. You have to foster that and develop it as you go through. I think the difference between innovation and creativity is innovation is creativity translated into action. It's great to have an idea, but you gotta be able to do something with that. You know, it's not good enough to just come up with Google as a search engine. You have to be able to translate that into action so it actually becomes something. And that's, that's the difference. Um, there's a bunch of different creative methods. These can be learned, they can be practiced, they can be taught. And so you have to do that. You have to figure it out. You know, I have a problem that I'm trying to solve. Can I get to the answer through evolution? Just doing what I'm doing maybe a little bit better. Does it take revolution? Do I have to do a different direction? Can I synthesize things together? Um, you know, so there's all these different options. So you have to teach yourself how to do them. And then there's some things that you've got to overcome. Negative attitudes and mental blocks and biases and all the rest of that. You can be a creative, but you have to work at it, and you have to learn how to be creative, and I think that's really important, because it's all well and good 
to do the first two thirds of design, which is you know understand your environment, figure out your problems and opportunities. But if you can't come up with the solutions, if you can't be creative, largely it doesn't matter. So creative thinking is as important as critical thinking, and we can do that. We can learn how to do it. Strategic learning and strategic thinking, and I use here the example of uh, strategic foresight, being able to see multiple alternative environments and to learn how to learn about that. And you know, our tendency, uh, particularly in design, and this, is, or at least in army design, it's a bad thing, is to say, what's our desired, you know, future, and then we laser because we focus on it. We go straight towards that desired future. It's back to the, uh, the quote from, uh, from the Chinese quote. We're focused on that goal. Our goal is this is the end state that we want. And then we say, well, we're not going to call it an end state. We'll just call it end conditions, and we know it's going to That's all BS. We're focused on what does it look like, and we ignore everything else. And those of you who have you know, been in combat, you, you know what bites you in the butt is not what you see, it's what you didn't see. It's where you weren't looking. And so that's the thing. If you look at alternative futures, you're broadening the aperture. You're looking more places, and therefore, there's a better chance that you won't be completely wrong. You'll be a little bit wrong, but you won't be completely wrong. Whereas if you're just focused on that single end state, you're guaranteed to be so, strategic thinking, strategic learning, I think is really important. Visual thinking, I talked about it. In order to do visual thinking, visual learning, you've got to draw. Now, you can look at that and you can say, this guy can't draw at all. Well, most of us can't. There was, I don't know who it was, but in our thing, we're, the workshop we're doing, somebody yesterday in Team 4 was a great drawer. They had a beautiful picture. I mean, it was awesome. I don't know who it was, but was it was ben. really, really. Was it Ben? That was Ben. Okay, so Ben. Ben is like artist par excellence. Because mine are all a bunch of stick men. But you know what? Stick men are good enough. And there's only one way to learn how to be a visual thinker, and that's just do it. So when you get the opportunity, draw, and communicate with drawings. Because when you draw, it becomes collaborative, and people can get up there, and you can hand the pen to somebody, and they start drawing, and everybody gets excited about it, because it's a picture. We like pictures. Um, and it helps us to generate ideas and broaden our thinking, because now we're doing something different. It's not just words. We're not just reading the doctrine. We're not going through the formula. We're being creative. By drawing, we're being creative. And so we learn how to do that. And the other thing that drawing is really helpful for is seeing and understanding systems over time. Because we can draw it out, we can draw out the narrative, we can, we can see how it unfolds. You know, there's that classic picture of the, you know, the, I, don't know, I think it starts out with a fish and then it kind of goes through the ape and all the rest of that and ends up being a human. It's that narrative, you know, that when we all, it's so visual, we all understand it implicitly. You know, it speaks to evolution, all the rest of that. It's a, you know, it's a classic picture's worth a thousand words. So you have to learn to be a visual thinker because it's, it's so important what we do. All right, so my final thought is this right here. And that is the professional and the designer has to be able to argue equally effectively both sides of any argument. Now, you may be passionately committed to one side, but you have to be able to argue both sides because it's only by arguing from the opposite side and you know, with the same ability and the same effectiveness that you can truly understand what you're up against. Um, you know, we call that red teaming in, in a formal kind of thing. Um, but it's, I think it's more than that. It's being able, as Aristotle said, to be able to hold these two opposing thoughts in your, in your mind at the same time. Because that's what critical thinking is really all about. That's what design is really all about. It's about being able to see with equal clarity both sides. So, I have no idea how long I've been talking, but I am done. Any thoughts or questions?